Are we can get to change the volume. Should be on here. <laughs> that is on and off. Is that it? Oh, is this not it? No, that's a thingy. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this third um, lecture in the science faculty series, Bad Science, Modern Myths Debunked. My name is Dr. Sheetal Silal, and I'm the convener of the course. Um, upper campus and this morning we really are in for a treat we have a very exciting lecture on cell and gene therapy the hype and the hope and I do encourage you to note down your questions as the lecture is going on because we will have uh, quite a, a healthy question session at the end of the lecture so to introduce our speaker this morning we have Professor Michael Pepper and Professor Michael Pepper is a director of the Institute for Cellular and Molecular Medicine, director of the SAMRC, Medical Research Council Unit for Stem Cell Research and Therapy, and a research professor in the Department of Immunology at the University of Pretoria. He is also Professor Associate at the Department of Genetic Medicine and Development at the University of Geneva. Michael has worked extensively in the field of clinically oriented molecular cell biology and his interests include stem cells and the human genome as well as the ethical, legal and social implications of work in these areas. And it is our very great privilege this morning to be able to host Michael, such a respected and world-renowned researcher in his field at our summer school today at UCT. Do enjoy and thank you Michael. Sheetal, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. Good morning, everybody. It really is a privilege to be here. UCT is my alma mater. Um, and when I was at UCT, the uh, Kramer Law Building was on Upper Campus. So early this morning, I headed up to Upper Campus and, and had a wonderful tour of Upper Campus, but became increasingly anxious. Kramer Law Building did not materialize. So anyway, I finally found my way to where we are at the moment. So it's a great privilege for me this morning to be able to bring you into my world. And I hope that some of you have been part of this world uh, in the past or are in this world um, at present. And I'd like to take you through a journey uh, beginning, uh, really at the beginning. This is really the beginning of everything, as you know. Um, and what we have here is the fertilization of an egg um, by a sperm to form uh, what we call a zygote. This is the, the picture of a zygote uh, created by in vitro fertilization. And there is enough information within both the sperm and the egg to trigger a series. And this series results in the division of this zygote into two cells and then four cells. And what you see here is the eight cell embryo. And this process continues. And this is a scanning of the cell micrograph. What you see here is probably about the 18 to cell embryo. And this gives you an, an appreciation of the size of the embryo at this point. These cells are all the same at this stage of development. And this then goes on after a series of processes to form a structure known as the blastocyst, which you can see here. What I would like you to do is focus on these purple cells, because it is these purple cells that will ultimately give rise to the embryo, which, as you know, will then go on to develop and form the adult uh, that of which I see many in this room. <laughs> um, these cells on the outside here go to, on to form the extracellular, the extra embryonic part of the embryo, which includes the placenta. But these are the interesting cells. These are the cells that go on to form the embryo. And please don't be alarmed, this is not a human embryo. This um, picture was in fact taken in 1985. Uh, in the Faculty of Medicine, in the Department of Immunology, when I started my PhD, 
after having finished medicine. Now, all of that information is contained within a structure called ribonucleus DNA, as you're very familiar with. And please, I'd like you to remember that most of the DNA is contained within the nucleus of any given cell in the body. There is also DNA in the mitochondria, but we're not going to focus on that today. Most of the DNA is here. It's a complex structure. As you can see, it has multiple um, levels of configuration, ultimately giving rise to these bases. Over here, we call these bases. And this is a famous double helix. One won the Nobel Prize um, more than 50 years ago. And you'll probably be more familiar with chromosomes. These are chromosomes seen by scanning a micrograph, which are in the nucleus of the cell, but are only visible in this form, the division. So how do we, as doctors and scientists, how do we annotate DNA in order to be able to understand what is included in the structure? Well, this is traditional bedtime reading for a, for a, <laughs> a molecular biologist. And as you can see, um, this is the human genome. I'm sure you're familiar with this structure. Um, it is made up of A's, C's, G's, and T's. So there are four nucleotides. As you can see here, so if you have an A here, you would have a T over here. If you have a C, you would have a G. So we talk about nucleotide pairs. Now, for those of you that are familiar with this, I'm sure you would be able to decipher what these letters are in red. Um, and that is insulin. Those are the parts of the DNA of the human genome that code for insulin, which, as you know, is uh, involved in the regulation of glucose homeostasis in the body. So, some basic facts. The human genome our human genome, in every nucleated cell in the body, contains three times 10 to the 9 base pairs that we inherit from each parent. That means that we have 6 times 10 to the 9 base pairs of DNA in every nucleated cell. Now, just imagine, as the cell has to replicate, going from a single cell to two cells, and as it progresses, it has to replicate with absolute fidelity every A, C, G, and T in that genome. And this process is repeated a trillion, that is 10 to the power of 12 times, from the development, from an egg to the development of an adult. So I'd like you to pause and just think about this um, in statistical or mathematical terms. You have this huge amount of information, which is not visible to the naked eye that has to be replicated, as I said, with absolute fidelity every time the cell divides. It goes through this process a trillion times. And it is nothing short of miraculous that all of us are in fact here, that we're able to get out of bed in the morning, that we're able to function, that we're normal, normal obviously being a very wide range, from one end to the other, but that we actually function given this complexity, and knowing that errors will be introduced at some point along the way. In fact, the body has put into place um, a spontaneous system in which it checks the DNA, and it corrects the DNA, should there at any time be an error that is introduced in the process of DNA duplication. As I look around me, I see people that are more or less the same shape. Um, but we're all different. And what is it that gives us these differences? Well, these are what we refer to as variants. We inherit variants from our parents. And our own DNA acquires several new variants in a lifetime. The majority of them occur in our body cells as a result of the environment. And you just have to think in South Africa of the sun. As the sun interacts with the cells in the skin, it in induces changes in the DNA. But as I mentioned, DNA duplication is a very complex and extensive process, and there are new variants that are introduced into the DNA during this process. So we share 99.9% .9 commonality 
in our DNA, which allows us to be who we are and to relate to each other. But it's those differences that give rise to the uniqueness of each one of us in this room. Now, those differences may be of three types. They may be neutral. In other words, they have no effect. They may be beneficial. And in terms of evolution, these are the variants that are selected for, that are beneficial. Or they may be deleterious, that is to say, harmful. And these are the variants that give rise to disease. And because of these variants, this is essentially what we see in our society, is we see people with skin of different colors. We see some people with curly hair, some people with straight hair, with green eyes, blue eyes, etc. So these are the differences that give rise to our uniqueness. Now, if we had to re represent in society in general, if we had to represent these differences, we could represent them on the so-called bell-shaped or Gaussian curve. So it would go from here to here. These would be the people with the least pigmentation in their skin. These would be the people that are the most pigmented. But the majority of people fall within one or two standard deviations in the middle of this curve. Now, this is a visible trait, as would be height, for example, and body weight. But the same occurs in things that are not visible to the naked eye. So if I had to cross you in the street, I would not be able to tell you what your level of cholesterol is, unless you had some signs of a very high cholesterol. But generally, this is not visible to the outside world, yet it has a major impact. So if you have very high cholesterol, if you're on this end of the curve, this will lead to the formation of atherosclerotic plaques, blockage of arteries, and this gives rise then to heart attacks and to strokes. Now, we have in our genome almost 20,000 genes. I spoke to you earlier about one of them, that was insulin, but there are 20,000 of these genes. You may be familiar with collagen. You may be familiar with certain hormones, with all of the things that give, the give rise to the structure and function within our bodies. Now, if one of those six billion base pairs that I referred to earlier that constitute our genome is altered in a way which alters function, in other words, gives rise to a deleterious variant, one of these genes would then give rise to disease. And these are the common, commonly um, referred to monogenic disorders like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, etc. One of the consequences of this, and please remember this is beyond the control of the individual infected, one of the consequences is that we, if we fall on the shoulders of the curve, this can lead to stigmatization and discrimination. These are individuals. Take, for example, people in South Africa who, are, who have the condition called albinism, who have very little pigment in their skin. They are severely discriminated against. variations in their gender and sexual identity, they are unfortunately also discriminated against in our society. So I refer to this as genetic discrimination. Once again, it's important to remember that this is beyond the control of the individual that it affects. Okay, so I've now told you a little bit about the, the machinery, uh, about the way in which all of this is is determined through this molecule called DNA. Now, through the process of development, that single cell that you saw in the beginning, the fertilized egg, becomes 300 different cell types in the body. You can think, for example, of cells in your eye, the cells that give rise to hair, your skin cells, your intestinal cells, the cells in your heart. They're all different. And our adult human body is made up of very many cells, as you can see here, from 10 to the power of 13 to 10 to the power of 14. So one of my students asked me recently, but please explain to us what 10 to the power of 14 means. We have no idea what 
conceptually what this means. So I tried. I didn't get very far, but this is about as far as I got. That is 10 to the power of 1. That is 10 to the power of 2. So the top one has been multiplied by itself. If we multiply 10 to the power of 2 by itself, it now becomes 10 to the power of 3. And PowerPoint has not, unfortunately, got to the point where it can allow me to do this 14 times. But if I did this process 14 times, we'd fill this whole room, in fact, probably this whole building, with little black dots. So that represents all of the cells in your body. And there are 300 different subsets of cells within all those cells, which give rise to the structural and functional components that you're familiar with. And remember that inside each one of those cells that has a nucleus, there are six billion base pairs of DNA. So let's pause again and just think about the incredible complexity of the human body, or any organism for that matter. And the fact that this all fits together and functions in a way that allows us to carry on our daily lives. As I said earlier, nothing short of miraculous. What is interesting is that these four to the power of 13 cells is only half of the cells in the body. Because we, our bodies also contain an equal number of microbes. So if I had to stand here and step aside and just let the microbes remain behind, you can't see them, but just imagine, I'd have a large number that would represent the cells, the microbes in my colon, or on my skin, or in my respiratory system. And these are very important, these microbes. They're part of a natural symbiotic relationship, and important for the generation of things to keep us alive. They can obviously get out of hand, and this then can lead on to disease. Right, so the very remarkable thing about this whole process is that 200 million cells are lost from our bodies every single minute. Okay, so all of these cells that we have in our bodies turn over at a constant rate. In fact, it is said that every atom in our body, every atom is replaced in a seven-year period. So seven years ago, you were something or somebody else, and now you are somebody who has a completely new and different constitution of atoms to what you had seven years ago. So how, how does this happen? How do we replace these 200 million cells that are lost from the body every minute. Let me give you an example. So this is a blood vessel. And these cells in the blood vessel, these red cells are red blood cells. They carry oxygen. These cells are, in fact, one of the few cells in the body, cell types in the body that don't have a nucleus. But we lose 3 million red blood cells per Okay, and the half-life of these red blood cells is 120 days. So how do, we, how do we replace these cells? And the answer is that we replace them through what are called stem cells. So stem cells are found in many parts of the body. They're found in the bone marrow. This, again, is our friend the chicken. This was taken at the time that I worked at UCT in, in the 1980s. And all of these parts of the chicken that are in red are the parts of the bone marrow, which the cells that give rise to the blood cells are found in. We also have cells in our gastrointestinal tract, our liver, our pancreas, in our teeth, in skin and hair. And I'll come back to this um, about the hair in, in a little while. In the central nervous system, so it was thought, in fact, that once you had a complement of neurons, um, that, that was it. And that it was downhill from there. So every neuron you lost could not be replaced. In fact, we know that this is not true. That there are cells in the so-called periventricular area of the brain that give rise to new neurons, should there be a loss of neurons through injury or disease. In the kidney, and then, of course, in muscle, the famous muscle satellite cells. So bodybuilders call on these properties of division of the satellite cells when they 
grow their muscles. And you may have heard recently of people growing steaks and hamburger patties in the lab um, using cells. Well, in fact, this has been done using satellite stem cells. The obvious difference there being, of course, that there is no blood vessels, there's no nervous system inside the muscle cells. Um, so it may be possible in future, and there are several companies that have now been developed in which these satellite stem cells are being exploited to grow muscle, and who knows, this may be the answer to vegan or vegetarian ideals in the future. In other words, we won't be killing any animals in order to generate uh, muscle um, for the purposes of protein intake. So I go back to this. This is the beginning. In fact, that fertilized egg that you saw in the first slide is a stem cell. And the definition of a stem cell is that it divides, first of all, and secondly, of the two daughter cells, one will remain a stem cell, and the second will go on then what we call differentiate to become one of those 300 different specialized cells in the body. Now, for as far back as I can remember, I was a medical student. The dogma has always been that the process of differentiation goes from left to right. In other words, we begin with a fertilized egg. This then goes on through cell division, as I showed you earlier. Here we have the blastocyst. Please again focus on the purple cells. These purple cells will then become different cell types in the body. I've given you a few examples here. This is bone. This is a nerve cell. This is a blood cell. And the dogma was always that this was a unidirectional process. You could only go from left to right. In other words, you could not reverse the process of differentiation. Well, about seven years ago, this whole dogma was turned on its head. We found that, in fact, if you introduced certain molecules into an adult cell, you could reverse the process could make these adult cells now become these purple cells again, which we refer to as pluripotent cells. Now, the very exciting thing about this is that you can now, depending on what you feed to the cells, you can now push them in any direction you want. You can cause these cells now to become blood cells, or you can cause them to become neurons, nerve cells. And you can imagine the therapeutic implications. So if I were to take skin biopsy from anybody in this room, these are the skin cells, and I was to introduce these factors into the cells. I would make these cells now become pluripotent cells, these purple cells. We call them induced pluripotent cells, or IPF cells. And if, for example, you needed more neurons, okay, which is probably something we could all do with. It would make you more neurons. If you needed more blood cells, you'd be able to make you new blood cells. And in fact, these cells are now being used in clinical trials, uh, for example, in patients with blindness. And it is planned that they will be used in other diseases as well. It's important to note that we don't give patients the purple cells. What we do is we take the purple cells from that patient we differentiate them into the cells that we need. So we'd need cells to be put into the eye and the retina. And then those cells are given to the patient. Clinical trials have already been done in Japan and are about to get underway in the United States. Very, very exciting because it means we can take your cells, differentiate them, and give them back to you. And that is very important because a lot of organ and tissue transplantation involves cells that are taken from other people and given to the patient. And that is where problems start to arise because the immune system of the recipient does not like things that are foreign and starts to reject them. But it's if, your own, if it's your own cells, they won't be rejected. So this work won this man on the right here the Nobel Prize in 2012. His name is Shinya Yamanaka, um, who did some of his work in the US, but was mainly based in Japan. 
for the discovery that materials are going to be reprogrammed to become pluripotent. And so again, please just think here of the enormous therapeutic potential of these cells. And I'm excited to say that there are people in South Africa that are working on generating IPS cells, although we haven't got the clinic um, just yet in South Africa. But you'll see that there are two people on the slide. The man on the left, um, Sir John Gurdon, has done his work for all of his life at Cambridge, UK. And he worked on a different species, so he worked on tadpoles. And he also discovered that mature cells can be reprogrammed, but he went about this in a different way. So cast your mind back, please, to the early one of the early slides where I showed you the structure of a cell, and inside that cell was a nucleus. That's all you need to remember, and that's a DNA found within the nucleus of that cell. So what John Gurdon did was he took a body cell, so for example, a skin fibroblast, or any, any cell that he was able to extract from the tadpoles he was working with, he took an egg cell. Now remember, the egg cell has only got DNA from the mother, but the body cell has got DNA from the mother and the father. Okay. So he removed the nucleus from this egg cell. So he had this shell. And he removed the nucleus from this body cell, and he placed it within the egg. So this, in fact, is analogous to a fertilized egg because it has DNA from both mother and father. Okay, And for, through a series of processes, he, were able, he was able to get the cell to divide, just as we see with the embryo in the early slides. It eventually then developed into a blastocyst. And what he did was he placed this blastocyst into the uterus of a surrogate mother. So he didn't do the work. Other people in the UK did the work. But this is the famous story of Dolly the sheep, which you may remember. OK, so Dolly the sheep was cloned from a cell that was taken from another sheep. That means that Dolly was a clone or was identical to the sheep from which the cell that was used in the cloning was taken. And this has been done now in virtually all domestic animals and is referred to as reproductive cloning. Let me say, however, that reproductive cloning is universally banned in humans. And as far as we know, there have been uh, no human beings that have been cloned. Now, the other thing you can do once you have this blastocyst is you can <coughs> remove these purple cells, very potent cells. And you can grow them. We can grow them in the lab. And these purple cells are similar, but not identical, similar to the IPS cells which I showed you earlier. And so you can use them for therapeutic purposes. You can differentiate them again into any cell type that you want. And in contrast to reproductive, this is now called therapeutic cloning. Let me say that. When I speak to people about stem cells, they say to me, yes, but this is such a controversial area. Why are you working in such a controversial area? Let me say that with the exception of reproductive cloning and embryonic stem cells, nothing else in the stem cell field is controversial. These are the two things that have raised the controversy. But everything else that I will tell you about from here on is not controversial. Why is the use of these cells, these embryonic stem cells, uh, why is it controversial? Well, if you take these cells from a blastocyst, the idea is that you are destroying a potential life. And for those people that believe that life begins at the moment of fertilization, and there are many other definitions of when life begins, this is just one. If you believe that life begins at the moment of fertilization, you may object to the use of a blastocyst then for the creation of cells that will be used for therapeutic purposes. OK, let me go on now to talk about stem cell therapy. So how do we use stem cells to treat patients? And it is a very, very busy field all over the world with many 
clinical trials, hundreds if not thousands of clinical trials going on, using stem cells from different sources for different applications. So clearly time does not allow me to do this in an exhaustive way, so I'm going to just give you a few examples in order to illustrate these points. So let's begin with the question of the source of stem cells. As we sit here today, there are three sources of stem cells that are used routinely to treat patients. The first is stem cells derived from the bone marrow. So this is a long bone, this is your femur, the long bone in your leg, and this shows a blow up of what you would expect to see in the femur here, and contained within the cells in the femur are these cells called hemopoietic stem cells. These are simply the cells that give rise to the blood cells that circulate in our body. The red blood cells that carry oxygen, the white cells that fight infection, and the platelets that stop bleeding. So one can put a needle, not into the long bone, but usually into the iliac crest, into the iliac crest and aspirate the stem cells, and these can be used for therapeutic purposes. We can also mobilize the cells from the bone marrow by giving the patients a drug. These cells to go into the circulation, and we can harvest these cells from the peripheral blood. And thirdly, I'm sure this will be familiar to everybody, here's um, a developing fetus, and this is the placenta. This, if you want, is the lungs of the fetus that are on the inside of the placenta, and there is a maternal and a fetal circulation. At the time of birth, the cord is cut, and it is possible, by inserting a needle into one of the blood vessels of the cord, to aspirate all the cells that are on the fetal side of the circulation in the placenta. And these are the so-called cord blood cells that can then be used as a source for therapeutic purposes. So as I say, this is what's going on right now as we speak. These are three universally accepted forms of stem cells that are being used for therapeutic purposes. What about the future? Well, I've spoken to you about iPS cells. I've spoken to you about embryonic stem cells. But fortunately, adipose tissue is fat tissue. There will always be a ready source of stem cells. Because these, these, will be found, these will be found in our adipose tissue. Here, for example, is somebody who is having a lipoaspirate in which the fat cells are being removed from subcutaneous fat in the abdomen. Um, this is the lipoaspirate here. We collect it, um, and this shows you in the tube. These are the red blood cells. This is the fat, and these are the cells that we use. And these are a ready source of stem cells, again, taken from one person and given back to the same person, avoids the problem of immune rejection. If I just go on to this slide, these are the cells. This is the fat over here that I showed you in the previous slide. We can grow this in the laboratory. This is what these cells look like if we stain them. And the exciting thing about these cells is we can, once again, depending on what we feed them, we can make them become cartilage, or we can make them become bone, or we can make them become muscle. Some people think you can make them become the cells that line the blood vessels. And of course, if you need it, we can make more fat cells. So you can see that there is a huge opportunity here. These cells are easily accessible. They can be used in a way which we call autologous, so from the same from one individual to that same individual. And there are probably close to 700 clinical trials being done around the world today to look at how these cells can be used for therapeutic purposes. And this will definitely be part of the landscape of everyday medicine as we go forward. Now I did mention to you that these are the three current sources of stem cells. And how are they used? Well, they're being used all over the world in a procedure that's been going on for more than 50 years, probably for about 35 in South Africa, called bone marrow transplantation. So this is usually given to people who have cancer, 
but can also be used for people who have, have blood and genetic disorders. So what you would do, for example, if somebody had a cancer and that person was going to need chemotherapy, is you would harvest the stem cells before you give the chemotherapy and you would put the cells into a fridge and leave them there and then give the person the chemotherapy. So why do we do this? We don't do this to cure the cancer. We do this because the chemotherapy is designed to destroy rapidly dividing cells. Remember, a cancer arises because cells divide in a rapid, uncontrolled way. Chemotherapy does not distinguish between the cancer cells and the other cells in the body that are dividing, which are the stem cells. So what happens is once you've given somebody chemotherapy, you may successfully have got rid of their tumor, but you have also destroyed the cells in the bone marrow that give rise to the white cells, the red cells, and the platelets that are needed for normal physiological function. So what you do after the chemotherapy is you go to the fridge, you take out those cells that you put there before you gave the chemotherapy, and you simply run them back into the patient through a drip, and they will spontaneously circulate around the body and take up residence again in the bone marrow, where they will regenerate all of these cells that the body needs to function normally. So just as an aside, um, I've said that the chemotherapy destroys the cells in the bone marrow. One of the other things that you know is common in people who have chemotherapy is they lose their they lose their hair, okay? And that is because the cells at the base of the root of the hair are stem cells. And so when you give the chemotherapy, you destroy those stem cells, and so that's why people lose their hair. But when you take away the chemotherapy and they start to recover, as you know, hair often grows back. Okay, so this is universally accepted, universally employed, and I have to say the only form of stem cell therapy that is recognized across the world. Everything else is part of what I call future applications. So you have heard of the use of stem cells to treat, I'm sure, just about every disease under the sun. Parkinson's disease, diabetes, blindness, heart disease. Here, for example, is a heart. This is a very famous disease because of the first heart transplant. What happens in a heart attack is one of these vessels becomes blocked, and all of the heart muscle that is irrigated by that vessel will then die. And so what is being done is when somebody comes in with a heart attack, is now to remove stem cells and to inject them directly into the heart, either into the blocked blood vessel or into that part of the heart that has been destroyed because it's been supply of oxygen has been removed. And the jury is still out, but it seems now, I think, with more than about 50 to 70 clinical trials that have been done around the world, that there is gain of function in the heart muscle of those people that have received stem cells. But just as an, as an aside, and on, on a lighter note, one of the things, one of the ways in which a heart attack presents, as you know, is with pain, chest pain. So when somebody comes into the emergency room, what you do is you stick a great big needle in here. This is very painful, so it diverts the attention away from the heart <laughs> and, and onto another part of the body. Okay, so th that's all I'm going to tell you about stem cell therapy. Um, as you will have seen from the title of my talk, I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about gene therapy. So what is gene therapy? Gene therapy is simply the modification of gene expression in an individual. So you remember I said to you that there were 20,000 genes. I gave you an example of insulin. We spoke about collagen. It is possible today, with the technology currently being used, to replace a missing gene to correct an abnormal gene or to add a therapeutic gene. So this is being done in many species, including humans, 
and it has now reached the, the, the point of clinical trials uh, in several parts of the world. And in fact, last year, the first three medical products were licensed. In other words, they are now commercially available that can be used to do gene therapy. Two of them were for cancer, and one was for a very rare disease called spinal muscular atrophy. So how does one do this? Well, you can either give a stretch of DNA, cast your mind back to the ACGs and Ts, so you can give a stretch of DNA to that patient that will replace a missing gene. So if they're in that person, if, in that patient, for example, if there's a variant that has been introduced in which the gene is missing, you can replace that gene. If there's an abnormal gene in which it's, the protein is being made but it doesn't function properly, you can correct that abnormal gene. If there's a missing gene, you can replace this as a therapeutic gene, and I think here of somebody, for example, who has hemophilia. So somebody who doesn't make factor eight, has a bleeding tendency, we can give them a gene which will eventually end up in the liver and will make the factor eight that that patient doesn't have or is unable to make. And the clinical results for hemophilia have really been remarkable. Now the important thing is that there are two ways to give the DNA, very broadly speaking. The one is very labor intensive and very expensive. And that is we have to take stem cells out of the body or normal body cells. We have to engineer the cells out of the body and put them back into the patient. So that is a labor intensive and very expensive procedure. The other way of doing this is simply to inject the DNA intravenously. And the DNA will then take up residence in the tissue where it is meant to act, and it will have its therapeutic effect. One of the most exciting things that I've um, had the privilege of being exposed to recently is children with uh, muscular dystrophy. I think most people have heard of muscular dystrophy. There are many types. You're probably familiar with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is where there's weakness and wasting of the muscles. And these children often die early, between the ages of about 15 and 20. It is now possible by injecting DNA that codes for the missing protein which gives rise to the muscular dystrophy, by injecting that DNA in intravenously to markedly improve the function of the muscles in children with muscular dystrophy. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this in these so-called monogenic disorders in, in the years that lie ahead. Something you probably will have been exposed to is genome editing. You may not have heard of it as genome editing, but you might have heard of it as the CRISPR babies, or these babies that were born in China last year, whose genomes had been engineered, um, which was a hugely controversial subject. So essentially, we can go in with specific tools, and we can rewrite the genetic code. So those ACGs and Ts that you saw at the beginning of the talk, we can rewrite that sequence in any cell of the body. So what happened with the CRISPR baby is they had their father was HIV positive, and the scientist in China went in and created embryos that lacked a protein that is necessary for HIV to function. And these babies were born last year. The controversy came in the fact that this person who did the experiments did not have authorization to do this and has recently been um, condemned to, to prison. So he now will be in prison for the next four years. So this is a highly controversial area. It is an area that will be relevant to medicine as we go forward. And I just highlight this notion of somatic versus germline. So this, these babies that were born, had their, they came from editing of the germline, so of, through in vitro fertilization of the, the egg and sperm of the mother and father. 
that means that they will pass on that editing to their offspring and to every generation that follows. And that's where the unknown is, and that's where the controversy arises, one of the controversies. Whereas if we do this on body cells, skin cells, liver cells, heart cells, etc., that will not be passed on to the next generation, there is no controversy. And clinical trials are in fact underway to rewrite the genome for therapeutic purposes in these body cells, which we call somatic cells. Okay, just to tell you that gene therapy is not a, as we used to say in medical school, it's not a red herring, it's not a rarity. As of the end of uh, 2018, there were close to 250 clinical trials being done around the world for uh, various diseases using gene therapy. So this is definitely, as is cell therapy, definitely uh, one of the ways in which medicine is heading. And in the future, we will definitely be seeing these treatments being applied routinely in the clinic. I'm often asked the question, why are you persisting with such high technology issues on the African continent? We're having difficulty in dealing with basic things. And I don't need to repeat the ESCOM story. The question of food security, the question of education, basic health. And my answer is very simple. There are common disorders on the African continent that can benefit from cell and gene therapy. And if we can find ways to administer these in a way that is cost effective and in fact even introduces cost savings, then it's a no-brainer. Then we have to bring these technologies onto the African continent. So common things are sickle cell disease. Several hundred million people on this continent suffer from sickle cell disease. Thalassemia, which is a little bit further north of here. And then infectious diseases such as HIV and hepatitis. And there are rarer disorders, which I list here, for which gene therapy is being shown to be effective. But really, in a country like ours, we can't focus on rare disorders. We have to focus on things that are common. So if you look at this list, which is the most common that we need to focus on, well, it is HIV. So let's talk a little bit about HIV. So more than 35 million people are living with HIV across the world, and the highest burden is in this part of the world, in sub-Saharan Africa. As you know, the way we treat HIV at the moment is with antiviral uh, antiretroviral therapy, it's lifelong, it has side effects, and when it has side effects, people feel worse than they did before they started to take their medication, so they simply stop taking their medication. And that results in what we call lack of compliance. Now when that happens, it favors the emergence of resistant strains of HIV. Okay, so there is clearly something we don't want. HIV is costly. Antiretrovirals, believe it or not, don't constitute the major part of the cost. It is, it does, there is cost involved, but it's not very expensive. What is expensive are the complications of HIV, infections, cancer, and most importantly, the socioeconomic impact, which I'll come to in a minute. And unfortunately, there are no successful vaccines for HIV to date. Um, as, you, as you may well know. So what about HIV in South Africa? How do we determine the cost of HIV in South Africa? Well, <laughs> there are almost 8 million people that are HIV positive in the country. And just over half, just over half are receiving antiretrovirals. That means close to 4 million people are not on antiretroviral therapy in South Africa. In our antenatal clinics, and I was recently in one of our antenatal clinics in Pretoria, um, and I looked across at the sea of pregnant women waiting to be seen in the antenatal clinic. There must have been about 150 to 200 women in the antenatal clinic. And it was terrifying for me to think that 30 to 40%, 30 to 40% of the pregnant women in our public health service 
are HIV positive. Just think about that for a moment. 30 to 40 percent of pregnant women in our antenatal clinics are HIV positive. So what happens to the children that are born from these mothers? Well, we have a very successful program, Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission in South Africa, which has reduced the transmission from about 30 to 40 percent to below 1 percent. That has been very successful. But what is beginning to emerge is that even those children that are born that are uninfected from HIV positive mothers are at a disadvantage. They're called HIV exposed but uninfected children. They are at a disadvantage. They show developmental delay and other limitations. Simply having been exposed to that HIV positive environment during development, even though they are not HIV positive. So think about that number, 30 to 40 percent. That's almost half of the population of newborn people that is entering into our South African society have been exposed to HIV in utero. And they have developmental delay. Not all of them, but it is being shown to be present in many of these children. So what sort of generation are we, are we creating in South Africa? I come back to the issue of socioeconomic consequences. Well, first of all, the economic act, act, ec economically active segment of the population is affected. The people are unable to work because they're sick. And we have things called child-headed households. So these are households where the oldest member of the family is a teenager, 15 to 20 years old. And um, my son, who is here, did a project on HIV a few years ago, and we went to visit one of these child-headed households. And there were eight to 10 children living in a home where the oldest person in the home was 15 years old because the parents had died because of HIV, and they receive uh, food parcels every month, um, obviously, because they're not able to provide for themselves. And it was, I think, within the first or second week of the month, and the child that was heading the household that we spoke to told us that the previous day or two, someone had broken into the house and stolen their food package. So just think about the socioeconomic consequences of HIV. OK, so all of this to tell you that what would be the solution to HIV in our country would be a cure for HIV. Antiretroviral therapy is not a cure. Antiretroviral therapy simply suppresses the disease. But as soon as you take away the antiretrovirals, the virus starts to grow again, and the disease comes back. So we've been working towards developing a cure using gene therapy. Very simply, let me just show you what this involves. So this is the cell, and that's its nucleus. This is the cell that would be infected by HIV. Here's the HIV, this Buckman figure here. And what it needs to do is it needs to bind to the surface of the cell. When it binds to the surface of the cell, it introduces its RNA into the cell, which eventually undergoes what is called reverse transcription and ends up in the nucleus, where it will replicate and then bud off from that cell. So the obvious thing to do here is to get rid of this docking protein, is to say if the HIV cannot bind to its target cell, we won't have any more infection. So this is in fact been done <laughs> in two patients. Uh, one in Germany and one in the UK, who had HIV, who developed cancer, who needed a bone marrow transplant, and in whom the cells that were transplanted were selected to be devoid of this protein. And these two people today are cured of HIV. So the question is, can we replicate this in people that are HIV positive? So what we're busy doing is harvesting cells, knocking out the target protein using gene therapy, introducing these back into the same patient, and then hoping